Well, hello, everyone, and welcome back to this episode of the Lambda Show. I'm your host, Matt Moore, and I'm very excited to present to you a special guest today that we have, uh, someone I have been wanting to get on the show for a little while. Uh, I'm going to do a shout out to Attila Demacus for getting us connected. Thanks, Attila. You are an absolutely awesome author and international speaker, creator of multiple open source libraries. Some of my favorite are Yisode, the Haskell web framework you should probably be using if you're on Haskell. And he has also created Stack, which you should also be using if you are using Haskell. I'm going to welcome you today to Michael Snoyman, the VP of Engineering at FP Complete. And today with Michael, we're going to discuss a couple of things. We're going to talk about a little bit about Haskell. Don't worry, we're not going to get super deep into that. Uh, there's no category theory in here, so you don't have to know mathematics to listen to this episode. We are also going to talk about Rust. And in particular, Michael has been doing some work in Rust of late. FP Complete has been uh, doing more of their projects there. And I'd like to get into that with Michael and try to understand this language. It's not really brand new right now, but it's fairly new on my horizon. And I'd like to dig into that. So Michael, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here today. You are a kind of a, in my opinion, a very important person in the Haskell community. I am very much a fan, as as I mentioned in the intro, very much a fan of some of the stuff you've done, uh, especially especially with the so stack. What are your overall thoughts with Haskell? I mean, you've been working with it for a while. Um, do you use it in any professional projects currently, and do you use it personally? Haskell by far is the go-to language for me on everything at this point. Uh, as we'll, we'll talk about later, I'm you know getting, I'm flirting with Rust and playing around with that. But the speed at which I can get things done in Haskell is just much faster. I have much more experience with, uh, with Haskell. And there's some interesting things. Maybe Haskell will always be faster than Rust. We can get into that. Uh, but at this point, if I have to throw something together, I'm doing it in Haskell, unless there is some other, you know, if, if I have a specific library I want to be pulling in from somewhere else, Maybe I'll be doing that. There are specific use cases where I'd be using something else. Uh, but for my personal stuff, I typically don't have that much time to uh, devote to programming these days. I spend more time managing than anything else. So if I got to throw something together quickly, it's going to be Haskell. At work, we're still, we're not exclusively Haskell. Our two preferred languages are Haskell and Rust, but we're using both of them in production settings on a regular basis. Is there a plan sort of overall for FP Complete to kind of shift definitely more into the Rust direction, or are you kind of in an experimental phase right now, just seeing how things go? Yes and yes. So okay. we're definitely, we are experimenting. We're experimenting with how far we're able to go. We've already made a few decisions of places where we're not going to use Haskell. Uh, one of the simplest ones, we tried IGHC JS years ago. Uh, in fact, FB Haskell Center, the web-based IDE, that was all done in GHC JS. We've moved away from that. We've seen other companies moving away from it. And we're not really going back in that direction. We're very happy with PureScript. And we use, okay. uh, depending on who on the project is, is doing this stuff, we'll use Halogen. I think there are a few other uh, preferred technologies. Uh, we don't do very much web or advanced, you know, SPA kind of applications these days. A lot of the stuff we do, you know, you sow it as a, you know, generate some HTML and fling it at the client. And I still think, despite everyone claiming otherwise, I still think that's a better way of doing things for most applications. So I still try to stick to that, or I can, I'm still happy with that. Uh, our biggest application we're working on right now is based around that kind of an approach. And it works, it still works. It's weird how things made in the 90s still mostly work. Uh, we don't need Ajax for every single page load. Uh, that said, there are times when you actually need it. Uh, PureScript is really nice for that kind of stuff. We, for various reasons, have fallen out of favor with, uh, with GHCJS on that kind of thing. But Rust and WebAssembly is, you know, definitely the thing we like playing with. I've done a few experiments with it. I don't think it's quite there yet, but it is. Well, uh, the first reason I got into Rust at this point was just it's fun. If you're, you know, most people out there get to experiment with Haskell. And I, oh, that's cool, but I'm going to go back to my day job now. When your day job is Haskell, you got to figure out something else you're going to experiment. With. So Rust was a cool experiment. And WebAssembly is, of course, the cool thing that people want to be playing with these days. Yeah, I, I like how you mentioned uh, just a, a quick side note here on the whole Ajax thing, because um, everybody, it seems like the push is just, you know, you've got to have a React front end and you've got to have these back end services and that's how things have to be. And 
I tend to agree with you. I think for for a lot of, you know, some of the apps, yeah, you, you do want a separation there and you want this really cool, rich front end. But um, yeah, I feel like half the time, especially for bus- basic business applications, that is unnecessary. It's unnecessary. It slows things down in many cases. There are a lot of downsides. Uh, and then there's just the fact that now you've got, what, four languages at play in any of your applications. You've got the backend language. You've got your HTML, which is basically a programming language. And someone's going to yell at me about that. Fine, it's a markup language, but it's a language. It says language right there. You got CSS. Now you've got JavaScript, but you're probably going to transpile, you know, CoffeeScript, yeah. if you remember that. You're going to transpile from something. So how many different languages? You've got your source maps. Please. Uh, yeah, we all got to do it. Everyone is putting some kind of JavaScript. I can't think of the last web page I put together that had no JavaScript in it, no something dynamic. But doing the entire thing front end, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty happy when I get to avoid doing that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, something I wanted to ask you about is, uh, and actually, as we mentioned earlier, Yisod is kind of the thing you should probably be using in Haskell. Um, if you're on Rust, uh, what kind of frameworks are there for that? So I'm not going to claim to be an expert on it. The we've done a few pilot projects that I'm that I was involved in, and then there were a few projects I wasn't involved in. People are talking about Actix Web. There's Hyper. There's Gotham. There's Warp. There are a few others. I am sure I'm missing probably the, the biggest one. Uh, the way that I understand things in the Rust community right now, Hyper is one web uh, engine that's underlying a lot of the other frameworks. And then you've got Actix Web, which is the other uh, half of the, of the story. And I think the jury is still out in a big way on how things are going to go end up going in the Rust world. I'm paying a lot of attention to it. I'm very interested in it. You know, there are, there are cases, one of these came up recently, where the Rust libraries or the Rust deployment story is a better story than the one around Haskell. And so we are considering using Rust for those kinds of things. And now, wait, we've never really done a, de- you know, a production web deployment of a major application in Rust before because we've always had Haskell. So what are we going to choose? And that starts to be a, a little bit of an interesting question. Yeah, I feel like there's this evolution with any language that is starting to become more popular, you know, gain mainstream acceptance where you have all these libraries. And, you know, for me, it's kind of going back to my baseline mentally is you have Ruby, right? Ruby on Rails, uh, which I worked in years ago. And it was this case of just if you're on Ruby, you're on Rails. They're, they're like they, that was it. Um, you have Active Record. You're just using Active Record. There were other options, but that was kind of the the de facto standard. And other languages you go to, if they're a little newer on the scene, um, there are a little more, a few more, uh, more questions on on what libraries you should use, etc. Um, so it sounds like Rust is kind of in that space right now, um, trying to find. S- not that it will ever necessarily settle on a single library or set of libraries for like, you know, database operations, uh, web, what, what have you. Um, but it sounds like it is still kind of finding its specific footing with those libraries. That's the way I see it. Uh, other people in the community may feel differently, uh, but I definitely see it that way. And I think one of the big things to point out is that it's only very recent that Rust landed this async await support. So if we'd had this conversation, I think it's a year and a half ago. We had this conversation before async await landed, and you said to me, should I use Haskell or should I use Rust for making a web server? And say, well, if you have a specific reason why you really want to be using Rust, I guess go for it. But it's a pain. And I, I have some you know, experience with the teaching side of this. I wrote this Rust crash course, and lessons, lesson seven in the original version was all about how do you do futures in Tokyo and all this stuff. It was before async await existed. And God, that was painful. That was a long, arduous lesson to write, to teach, to try to break it up, to try to explain ownership and closures and all these different things, how they all mesh together in this world of callback hell. It was like the worst version of JavaScript combined with the worst parts of Haskell's type system combined with the worst parts of C++'s memory management. It was bad. Now, you know, to Rust's credit, they did a great job at making it a zero cost abstraction and preventing you from shooting yourself in the foot using the borrow checker. Those were all great things. But from an ergonomic, you know, they always talk about ergonomics in the Rust world. It's a great word. Haskell world should pay attention to that word. So they pay attention to these ergonomics all the time. They they were terrible. Now, everyone knew it was terrible. Uh, but I think everyone was lying to themselves a little bit saying, yeah, Rust is ready for the web. Uh, Rust is ready, f- ready for network services. You could do it, but it was difficult. Things changed. As soon as async await came out, Tokyo started adopting support. Or, 
they were working the whole time. Once Tokyo released Zero Dot Two and they had support for it, it was a different ball game. And it's now I've you know I've put out a few blog posts in the past few weeks showing async await support in Rust, and it's really easy to to put that together. It doesn't take much thought, and that's that's what you want. You don't want to be thinking about the unimportant parts of your code. That's a general theme through all of programming. If you're able to find a, you know, a meaningful abstraction and you're able to get that logic out of the way so you can actually see on your screen the actual business logic you're dealing with, things are different. You couldn't do that originally uh, with, uh, with the old way, Tokyo 0.1. So I'm happy with the, with the direction things have gone. So that said, now we're only a year and a half later. You know, everyone is still adapting. It took a while before all the frameworks were able to update to it. And now people can start to see for real what is, you know, what's worth having, what's, what's not worth having. There's a lot of work done previously to make it a little bit more ergonomic to deal with that whole callback situation. You don't have the callback situation. Now people can start to explore, okay, what, do, what would a great framework look like in an async away world? When you say ergonomics, are you talking sort of about the, as I sort of envision that term, the concept of, uh, and I'm going to do a little, I'm, I'm going to deviate here into the Haskell world for a little bit. Uh, Haskell obviously seems to be very much about, you know, as not entirely, right? There's there's cases where it doesn't always follow this, but in general, uh, functional purity as much as possible, right? And I, I do feel myself sometimes like Haskell gets into this realm of, we want to have the purest of the purest of the mathematical abstractions so that it fits this concept called category theory. And we won't have to talk about category theory because I know that's a, that's a topic everybody wants to hear about on the show. I'm kidding. Um, but I wonder if, if Haskell loses what I'm thinking you mean by the term ergonomics, where, like, for example, I as a programmer, like you said, I want to see the business logic, right? I need a clear abstraction for that. Um, I was actually having, I've been having conversations around this uh, right now where I'm uh, at uh, work wise. And, uh, trying to just sort of clean up some of the mess where I can go look more or less step by step. I mean, some of the cleanest code that I like to, to write if possible is, you know, I can look at some function that is a composed function of other functions and it might be like a service endpoint that I'm hitting. Right. And I can look at that service definition and say, I know line by line, all the steps this service is doing, right. Getting that nice clean sort of, I would like to call it, Maybe somebody has a better term. Maybe you do. I don't know. But I sort of refer to this as like bullet point programming <laughs> where it's like, yeah, my service is essentially a bullet point of high level functions that are being called to do all these things. Now, obviously, you have I.O. that's going to go on with a lot of these things. If your service doesn't do I.O., it's probably a useless service. Um, unless it's some pure calculator. I don't know. Well, even then you need I.O. You still have an incoming request. So. Uh, is that kind of what you're referring to with with ergonomics? Because I think that's a key point. I think one of the issues I have seen in the general computer programming community of, uh, at large is whenever you try to talk about FP, the moment you start talking about some of these, like maybe we could call them non-ergonomic uh, mathematical abstractions in code, I feel like that's where you lose a lot of people, especially beginners or or actually even just, you know, people who have been doing this for 20 years, but they've been programming in Java. You know, it's they they don't understand like OOP has worked for me. Imperative style of coding has worked for me. Um, why this FP thing? And I know Rust is not strictly speaking going for functional programming, uh, although they have borrowed a lot of constructs as many languages have. Um, but yeah, is it I, that was a lot. <laughs> is that sort of kind of the, the theme you're going for with, with that concept of ergonomics? So I'm not going to take credit for the theme of ergonomics, and I'm going to attack the theme of ergonomics. So ergonomics okay. is the interesting. Term, uh, well, in a, in a way. So the Rust community are the ones who talk about ergonomics a lot. And they're talking about generally, let's make it easier to write code. Now, my objection to it actually comes very much from what, you're, what you just said. Ergonomics are relative. If you are deeply in the functional programming world and you've been writing monads, because you want to talk about monads, you've been writing monads for the past 20 years, then there's nothing more natural than defining a monad instance for futures and then using that in order to handle async programming. But if you've been coming from a, if you've been, you've been writing assembly and you're, that's what you're used to, that's going to seem a little bit weird. That's not going to be ergonomic. So I do have a little bit of a concern that ergonomics can mean 
let's just make this be whatever the person writing it is familiar with already. And I think that's a real concern uh, without some kind of objective stance on these things. I've run into some of this with Rust, going from beginner to intermediate in Rust. When you first start off in Rust, actually beginner, then beginner intermediate, and then in intermediate is where this really happens. You start off a beginner and you just start typing in code and something doesn't work and you cargo cult something and you throw in an extra, you know, ampersand and you start throwing an ampersand star and you don't really know what that is. It's like this weird deref and borrow combo, but someone told you to do it and you just do it. And you're fine and you're happy and that's super ergonomic. And then you get a little bit later on, you're like, why the hell did that work? That doesn't make any <laughs> sense. And you start scratching your head and eventually you get, you cross that line and now you, be, now you finally understand these things. And now it's great. Now you don't have to write out all these explicit borrows and all these explicit casts or other things that you would have had to do otherwise. And you're like, great, the language is really nice. But that middle phase where you're trying to get over that hump of, well, I've been doing things, but I can't figure out why it's broken in this one case. It worked perfectly 99 times, but that one out of 100 times, I cannot figure out how to solve that problem. I consider that maybe a breakage of ergonomics. But then again, the intermediate programmer and the advanced programmer is going to look at that and say, that was perfect. That's exactly what I wanted. So all of this is very relative. Oh, space. Let's talk about white space. White space and Haskell. Oh, oh is, yes. Is that, is that ergonomic or is that not ergonomic? Well, if you talk to a Pythonista, they're going to say, that's brilliant. I love that. And if you go to a Ruby developer or you go to a... Perl developer, that's actually the fun one. Perl people stare at Python, what the hell are you doing? What, what, what is it? <laughs> where are my curly braces, right? So this Rust decided we're gonna go with curly braces. Is that because it's more ergonomic? I think they would tell you yes. And I'd say it's, there's nothing inherently one way or the other. I, trans, I transfer between those two syntaxes regularly. They're fine. I have nothing for one or the other. It's familiarity. Yeah, that's that seems to be the key. I, I like what you said. This is really it is a subjective thing. And it I think it largely depends even from a language design perspective, well, especially from a language design perspective, your language designers are going to obviously put it whatever interject, whatever their uh, preferences are from other languages, um, which is why I think most languages anyways do have a very similar uh, feel to them. Maybe Haskell accepted or Idris or something like that. Right. So if you if you look at Rust, they definitely care about ergonomics, but that's not their primary goal. That would probably be the secondary goal. The primary goal is zero cost abstractions and that whole family of how can you make a systems programming language that allows you to have safe code, you know, et cetera, et cetera. That's, that's the, the main thing. And then secondary to that is, okay, now that we know what our goals are, let's make it as easy to, to work with as possible. In many ways, Haskell has the same kind of idea. They're saying we're a pure, purely functional programming language. Why are we that? Well, because it gives you a lot of benefits. You're able to do things like software transactional memory. That's great. You're able to, you know, you're, uh, how did you put it? Uh, bullet point programming, correct? Yeah, yes. <laughs> you can do that in many ways because you have immutable variables throughout. Many of the features of Haskell, many of the things forced on it by pure functional approaches lead to the ability to do those kinds of things. Uh, so it's great. And I think it's a good guiding star. But I'd really like to have a little bit more of a push in Haskell as, you know, like the second goal of let's make it a little bit easier to actually do these things. Do you think that something is possible to have happen in the Haskell community uh, in general to, to get some of those uh, more practical ways of handling things that Rust is going for? Uh, so I, th I would say that we have done some of it, uh, okay. various parts of the Haskell community. And again, this is where we get into subjective parts. Yeah. I'm someone, you know, I'm, I'm, I've spoken many times about extensible effects are not something that I think is worth spending the time on. And someone who's listening right now is screaming at their screen. Congratulations. So people disagree. That's the point. So can you, as a, this huge community, the, one of the biggest problems that the Haskell community faces, which is a strength and a weakness, it is a varied community. You have people on a fairly large spectrum from pure industrial people who don't care about the purity. They just happen to think this is a good language all the way to people who are purely academic. They are, you know, generating PhDs based off of the work that they're doing in Haskell, and they don't care if it works in industry. I'm not sure if that person actually exists, by the way. I'm not calling anyone out. Sure. But theoretical, the theoretical end of the spectrum is, I don't care if any company ever uses Haskell for anything in production. I just want to make this mathematically pure thing. And you have a lot of data points in between amongst the Haskell community. 
And that's a unique challenge. I don't think any other programming language really has that exact same level of challenge. Rust doesn't, Python doesn't. You can go through these other languages. They have fairly clearly defined niches that they're targeting. Haskell, in some ways, is a, is a fairly clear niche, purely functional programming. And yet, for some reason, it's attracted this wide spectrum of people all over the place. Talking about safety, uh, which, you know, something I know we've talked about before and talked about a little bit here on the show is uh, what attracted me originally to FP was not so much the lofty ideals of, you know, mathematics, uh, this beautiful layer of mathematics in my code. It was an interesting concept, but that wasn't really my goal. My goal was to, and I, and I think the goal for you as well, and a lot of folks uh, was safety. It was, you know, I've got all this logic in my code. I've got IO stuff going on. I've got, uh, you know, transactions I needed to keep track of, et cetera. Um, what are the best ways to manage that? Um, obviously type systems, that's great. You know, if, if you are a Rubyist, a Pythonista, you don't really have access to those things, which is crazy. I know in, in uh, Ruby and Rails, uh, it was the infamous guard clause you had to write for every function. It was like, you know, check to see that this thing coming in as a, as a parameter to a function is, you know, has this is of this type. And like it had a type system of sorts. But it was like you had to query the type system to see, are you this type? Do you respond to these methods? Like um, it was a little bizarre. And it's funny, it's like you ended up having to do a sort of pseudo type programming inside each method to verify that the stuff you're passing in is actually going to work <laughs> um, because somebody could just pass anything in. There's a whole thing with duck typing. So um, yeah, that that was an issue. And so type systems, sure, they, they help with that. Uh, obviously with Haskell, you've got, for IO specifically, you've got monads, you have IO and I'd like to ask you what your thoughts are on the general notion of monads. Do you think they are, I, I know I've been hearing a lot of stuff in the FP community and across different languages, this idea that maybe monads are not the best way to go. Again, they're trying to bridge that, like go more towards that pure functional paradigm. But a couple of conversations I've had for comparison here is what if we took the, if, if you're going to pick up a language like Haskell, right? You have to learn you don't have to learn category theory per se, but if you want to get deeper into it, you kind of sort of start doing that at some point. And I'm wondering if, since that tends to be a barrier to entry for a lot of folks, uh, I'm wondering if there's this concept, there's no term for it I've heard. I'm giving it this word. I'm going to come up with another catchphrase here. Uh, we did bullet point programming. The next one I'm going to throw out there is uh, um, sort of smart compilers. Like, maybe that's a terrible word for it. But it's this concept of rather than having uh, a programmer, an end user of that language, have to uh, learn sort of how the math works in code, uh, remove that abstraction out of the code that you're writing as, as a programmer, an end user of that language, and move it into the compiler to have the compiler essentially do the same kind of checks in a sense, the same effective outcome of looking for IO boundaries, uh, checking to see essentially a form of static analysis, but at compile time to see if, you know, you've caught this exception, if you've handled that error in an appropriate fashion. Uh, again, I know there's a lot there, but like, do you think monads are the wrong way to go about this? Uh, as a general concept, I'm not blaming Haskell here. Um, other languages, other languages have monads and, do you think that the smart compiler concept, uh, not the formal term, just just my crazy ad hoc term, is is a better option to that? Do you think there's something around that? And and also, is that something that Rust kind of is trying to do to a degree? Right. So I'd break it up into two pieces. What's the plumbing and what are the fixtures? I, I think it's Git that talks about the porcelains. Yes. So what's the porcelain? So do we talk about monads at the top Top levels, is that the thing people are thinking about? So in Haskell, you have to get into that pretty quickly, except you don't really have to. There's a way that you could you know, squint at Haskell and turn it around. And we've act I've actually talked to people about doing something like this. What if everything was do notation? What if everything, hey, what if addition lived in do notation? What would that mean? Well, it means that it's going to live in a monad. The result, you know, an int plus an int is an m int for any m. Well, that's actually still pure. Because now that you've said for any M, that applies to identity. So you've got purity back. You haven't lost purity, but you can yeah. still stay with monads. 
Okay, that's interesting. The language would feel very different. Uh, so I'm not sure it would be a good change. But if you run with the mental model and you run with that idea, and you say, yeah, we're just going to say that every single result of every single function has to be in some kind of a monad, and then you constrain the monad. Well, this thing can this thing performs I.O. This thing does STM. This thing throws an exception. And you put some kind of a constraint. Well, now you've gotten into an interesting position. What kind of a language would this be? Well, it almost seems like by forcing monads everywhere, you don't have to talk about monads anymore. Yeah. It's no longer about M. It's no longer about the monad. It's about, well, this feature, this effect, this result thing has these things associated with it. And I've never, you know, I've, I've done so many different preludes. I'm not going to do another prelude, but I've always played around with the idea of that would be a really interesting prelude. That would be a, a fun, you know, weekend project. And how far could you get with a language like that? What would it feel like to not be able to do one plus two plus three? To have to bind out one plus two is X and then, you know, X plus three. That sounds ridiculous. But on the other hand, what kind of benefits? You don't have to teach users about the difference between a let expression and a, or let statement inside a do block. Let's talk about it that way. And binding, they're the same thing. Under the surface, it's all using the same monads. And I'd argue that we're, we've seen a lot of justification that monads are really a good abstraction. And the reason is because everyone keeps reinventing them. That would be the sign for me that it's a good abstraction. JavaScript has something very close to monads. And I, I don't remember the details. Apparently, uh, promises in JavaScript are not quite monads. I don't remember what they screwed up to make it not a monad. I wonder if this is similar to in Scala, we have futures and futures are not exactly monads either. I think the problem was somewhat twofold. I don't remember the full argument either myself, but it was something like they are not lazy, which was an issue. And they also rely on implicit state, uh, implicit global state, uh, as opposed to being explicit in that sense. So I think that was that was kind of the issue with with futures. Of course, then you have other libraries out there that have tried to to change that uh, a bit uh, and sort of like fix the future, for lack of a better term. But anyway, yeah, back to you. Sorry. Yeah. No, 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 no. That's exactly the point. And yeah. you see this thing popping up, and everyone wants to be a monad because you get these laws, and we're beginning to understand that. You know, I don't come from the pure mathematical side of Haskell, and that's where I take my hat off to them and say that's that's a good influence you've had on this industry. The idea that you can get across the idea that if there's a law, if there's a mathematical proof, this thing, you can suddenly think about your code in a different way. You can approach it in a different way. You get to reuse functions without, you know, you can use MathM or for or whatever, or Traverse. All these are, you know, Traverse yeah. is very popular in the Scala world, right? Everyone loves yes. Traverse. Yes. Apparently, every single Scala function can be replaced by Traverse applied n number of times. So I'm told. Uh, so it's, you know, that's cool. We have the laws. We're using the laws. And they're leading us to a really nice destination. It's great. Uh, and I like that. You know, so I think monads are probably a good idea, even if they're only, you know, they're only under the surface hidden away. So now to tie it into the other part of it, the question you asked, how does that affect Rust? Yeah. So Rust has gone through this iteration over the past few years where they keep adding in features. And each time they add in a feature, Someone out there, some obnoxious Haskeller like me, someone out there says, but you could have just used a monad. Why didn't you just use a monad? If you just <laughs> invented do notation again in Rust, then you wouldn't have to add a new feature. And I've been talking this out with a few people. It's a deep philosophical divide between Rust and Haskell. Haskell says, I have a general way of solving this problem. Use the general way of solving this problem. That gives people more power. That's great. And you can see this. Forget about everything else. Go down to syntax because everyone loves talking about syntax. Haskell lets you define your own operators because why not? Let everyone define their own operators. Most other languages don't. Well, why not? That's a great feature. Why did Rust say, no, screw that. You can't define your own operators. You can overload operators in Rust. They let you overload basically everything, but they don't let you define your own. And there's this, this philosophical gap between giving the programmer a lot of power Versus, hey, if we take away just a little bit of power and we force you into certain boxes, overall that leads to better code. The extreme version of that, and I, I think we promised we're not going to like just beat up on Go the entire time, but the extreme <laughs> version of that. This is, is the Go. first time we've mentioned Go, so this is that okay. It, <laughs> that's true. That's true. We're good. We're good. So Go is the extreme version of that. And it says, you know, we don't trust our developers, essentially, something along those lines. Yeah. Uh, or if you want to be nice about it, I don't want to burden my developers with thinking about all these other questions. 
How should I handle errors? That's something that comes up all the time in Haskell. Every time I go on Twitter, someone who wants to argue with me about error handling in Haskell. So Go doesn't have that question. Everyone knows how to handle errors in Go. It's always the exact same thing, right? You just need a keyboard macro to insert error handling and you're done. And we Haskellers look at that and say, that's so ugly, that's so much code repetition, that you know it violates my principle. You should just be able to see the business logic. On the other hand, how many hours of debates do they get rid of? And Rust falls a little bit in the middle on these. Rust said, yeah, we're going to introduce the question mark operator. Oh, but that could have been a monad, and then you could have done accept, and then you could have, no, nope, we're doing the question mark operator. That's it. That's the way we're going to do it. And then they get to futz around a little bit about how you define the operator, define the types, and how you define from instances, implementations, sorry. Uh, my nomenclature by default is still Haskell nomenclature. So you see this, this like the spectrum between we're going to take all the control, you know, the go side, all the control away from the developer, because that's what's going to lead us to, you know, easy to produce, easy to maintain code. All the way over to Haskell, we're going to give the developer full functionality, full flexibility to do whatever they think they need to do, because we trust the developer to come up with a good idea. I've had a lot of discussions with, uh, I, I used to do Go for a little bit. It was about six months. And then I, I felt, I'm, I'm going to bash here a little bit. I felt like I was pulling my hair out. All right. <laughs> it was. I did too. <laughs> um, because I, I very much did feel like, uh, especially with, you know, what they're doing with, uh, returns in go, where you'd have like that, you know, return, what was it? Nil value where nil supposed to be the error. If there was an error and then it'd be like error comma, you know, nil, if, if the value was not present and it was just like, at, so, at some point I started looking at this and comparing it to Haskell with monads and I'm like, this looks a lot similar to the same concept of, of, you know, an either type, for example, um, why didn't they just do something like that? Anyway, Go is, yeah, not been a, Go and I have not been on good terms. Uh, once I was about two weeks into that project, I was like, okay, I've, I'm done. <laughs> I don't want to do this anymore. Uh, for sure. That that's interesting. Uh, you said it though, in general about the monad. So in your opinion, the monad is a, it's a good and useful abstraction. Yes. It may be overused. There may be cases where we're trying to throw Monad in, and I definitely think we scare people by talking about it. I have made a valiant effort. I've probably failed. I try to avoid using the term Monad too much when I'm giving talks, especially when I'm giving it to beginner audiences. Yeah. Someone, don't remember who it is. Uh, I apologize, I don't remember. Someone made a great argument in the Haskell community. We should be talking about the IO type. It's not the IO Monad, it's the IO type. That's it, it's a type. It happens to have a monadic interface. The thing that defines it isn't the monad. The thing that defines it is that it's letting you do IO. And I've tried to go, go towards that way of, of speaking. Even if it's not a huge semantic difference, we've built up so much fear around this concept of a monad, uh, which is really, I think it's unfortunate. I think there are easy ways to get people comfortable with it, but we've built the fear in. And so now people don't it's a it's a writing technique that i've learned i don't remember who taught it to me either i forget attribution is not one of my strengths That's okay. uh, one of the one of the writing techniques i used to have is to say okay this section is going to be hard now let's get started and that doesn't help anyone if it's really that hard maybe you should put in a little bit of a, of a warning or you should probably simplify it and break it up into smaller sections but for the most part all you do is you engage hard mode in someone's brain just not a mode they want to be in. Yeah, I agree. Um, that's interesting. I, I do like the the type conversation. I I do find like uh, you know some folks I've I've um, spoken with uh, both in Scala and in the Kotlin community with you know the use of Arrow uh, from forty seven degrees. Uh, I did find I, I started that that same approach you talked about with okay let's not worry about Monad let's not we don't have to talk about that. Yeah, here's the either type. Here's the option type. Here's IO type. And you just show them like, again, with with uh, with either, it's like you have a left or a right by convention. You've got an error or you've got a value. I I do think that really clicked with people. They they started to see that more so. Um, and then they were like, is that really what a monad is? Effectively, at the end of the day, yes. That is That is the end goal. It's to give you a way to better control this flow in the program. Uh, so you know what you're dealing with. And uh, yeah, then you can, of course, bake stuff on top of that, like like we talked about with Traverse, where it's like, now you can traverse all the things and, uh, you know, essentially fold them all into 
an either or an option or whatever it is you're dealing with, um, which is kind of neat. But uh, yeah. One of the flaws I see, this is not Haskell specific. This isn't even programmer specific. You get a new toy, you get a new idea, you get a new anything. Now I got to go apply it somewhere. When you introduce it as the monad, everyone wants to go figure out where do I get to go use my shiny new tool? Uh, I've seen this with specific libraries in the Haskell ecosystem where people have come to me and said, this, you know, library X is so great. It solves so many problems. Like, okay. Name one. Just tell them. I don't know what it's for. Just tell me, what is this thing for? And I've, I've legitimately had people not be able to explain to me a single use case for this great library that they want to use. It doesn't mean the, the use case doesn't exist, but in their minds, what I've always noticed, they overblow the, you know, appropriateness of this thing. Monads are probably like that. It's also part of the whole hype curve. Everything has a hype curve, right? Yeah. And, you know, monads, I think we're now at the point of the hype curve where we can just say, hey, we can just use monads. Uh, I, again, there may be better ideas and better abstractions, uh, or you don't need an abstraction at all for, you know, for specific cases. That's entirely possible. But overall, I think, thankfully, we're no longer in the cool, everything's a monad, make everything a monad. I think we're past that phase, which I'm, I'm grateful. Yeah, I I think that's kind of why I was asking about monads in general because I my fear is uh, I I personally I I enjoy monads I get them I understand how they work it took me a little bit of time I mean I uh, I think in a prior conversation in the prior conversation we had uh, I was telling you it took me a little over a year to like really understand what was going on there uh, again in Haskell and part of that was probably because I was still getting used to Haskell uh, syntax and semantics but. Um, which is, is kind of a point of, I made on an earlier episode of this show with a friend of mine, uh, we were talking about functional programming as well. And one of the points we made was like, don't, if you're teaching FP to someone, don't teach them in a language like Haskell, if they're already familiar with this language, start showing them maybe these concepts in their language to help them better grok what's going on. Um, because I think a lot of people who try to go pick up Haskell just right off the bat, you've now introduced an additional problem where they have to learn a language uh, with with very different syntax than what they're accustomed to. And now you have two problems. They don't understand FP uh, and they don't understand uh, the language. So that can be a little tough. I think at some point, in my opinion, it seems to be a good idea to go to get into Haskell. I think if you really want to dig into pure functional programming, Haskell has a special place in my heart. I really enjoy the language, but it is very different. You know, if, if you've got someone who is used to Java, et cetera, it's like, what is this Haskell thing? What is this bind operator? I, you know, it's seriously that that's like one of the biggest things I've seen when, when you introduce a monad in Haskell to someone, they, their eyes just look at that operator, you know, the double arrow equals. And it's like, I don't, what, why, how does this work? Um, so it gets, it gets very confusing. Um, you know, that, that comes back to the ergonomics discussion. I had to tap into my, you know, my Perl guy roots. I did Perl go for, for it. I, I used to be a, a Perl. Yes. Okay. Go for it. So, you know that, you know, the mantra Perl is optimized for someone who's knows Perl. It's not optimized for the person who's learning Perl because you're going to learn Perl once and then you're going to use it the rest of your life. And Haskell has a lot of that same feel to it. The bind operator. I have written a hell of a lot of code that directly uses the bind operator or the 15 variations, you know, depending on which direction you put the arrows in, which order you put the, well, that's ridiculous. You know, you go to me 15 years ago and say, one of these days, you're going to see these six different operators that all have the same three characters and they're going to be different permutations. And you're going to know what each one of them means. I'd say you're crazy. There's no way in hell I will ever understand. It makes perfect sense to me now. And it's obvious. And of course, anyone, you know, should be able to use it. And I can write code that way. Uh, and that's optimized for me. That's optimized for people who've gotten over that hump. That's ergonomic for, you know, the elite Haskellers in the world. Uh, you don't even have to be that elite. You can be using Haskell for two years and you can be very comfortable with it. But what about those people in the first two years? It's definitely not ergonomic for them. And then yeah. here you get into that real trade-off. What are we optimizing for? Do we, how much do we want that learning curve of Haskell to be? You know, Perl, it kind of works because Perl, well, Perl 6 is a different crazy story. Perl yeah. 5, it had a learning curve, but it wasn't an insane learning curve. The Haskell learning curve, I think, is significantly more than the Perl learning curve. So if you have to keep deferring and keep adding in all these extra things, oh, but now you've got to learn, I'll make fun of myself, now you got to learn conduit, and now you got to learn Yosoda, and now you got to learn what this resource T thing is, 
And now you got to learn about async exceptions. And now you're ready to do production Haskell code. That's a, that's a lot of barriers. Do we really want to push, push things off that far? What, one question I wanted to ask you, speaking of barriers, is it can be very difficult to convince people to try some of these, you know, whether it be a new language, uh, functional programming. And this is a little less about Rust and more in general about new ideas at companies. Again, as we discussed, there's, there is that hype-driven development phase you go through where it's like, do you really have a good use case for this? But in, ter- in terms of like getting an organization to adopt something that, at least for that organization, may actually make better sense, uh, convincing hearts and minds is not always an easy task. Um, what are your thoughts on that? It's, it's magical. It's, it's difficult to find the right combination of... You know, the stars have to align to a certain extent. This is not, this is probably well beyond the realm of technology. You, know, you could go back, I'm a religious person, you could probably go to religion and say, how do you convert someone? How do you go off and make, because <laughs> in some ways we're very religious about our, our programming languages. That is very true. Probably, yeah. We could probably learn from missionaries. How do you convince someone to come and, uh, come and do this stuff? Uh, it's hard. The easiest way by far to convince someone to, let's choose Haskell in particular. The easiest way to convince someone is when they have an identified need. That's sales 101. Identified need, that's when you can sell something. So someone who has just spent, uh, I'll use me as an example, someone who has just spent two or three years writing Java web applications and knows how difficult those are to maintain. I'm so sorry. I feel feel your pain. (laughs) This is like two years ago too. I mean, it was pretty bad. (laughs) Oh my God, the amount of XML. And then I, then I ended up writing XML libraries in Haskell later on because I, oh, whatever. Yeah. XML and I have, it, have an, our own story. Anyway, so, you know, I had an identified me. That's how I got into it. I knew that I would not be a successful programmer if I kept doing things the way I'd been doing them. So I, I, I ditched Java and I went to PHP because, well, that's actually easier. And I see a lot of people, you know, I see a similar thing, C++ over to Python or Ruby because this type system is horrible. I don't want a type system, so I run away. Java, same basic thing, so we run over to PHP. I was lucky enough to have a realization moment of there's gotta be something else. It can't be that it's bad Java or PHP, you know, bad PHP, there's gotta be something else. So I felt that identified need. Uh, but you have to have a certain kind of person, someone who's willing to make some trade-offs. In complete honesty, from a business, from an economic perspective, it was not worthwhile for me to start learning Haskell when I did. The language was immature. The learning material was immature. I had to build up a whole bunch of libraries. I could have built the, the you know, the services that I was being paid to build uh, without having to spend a whole bunch of free time building up libraries at the same time if I'd chosen a more developed language. And now I happen to think that I got a lot of personal benefit out of it, a lot of growth, a lot of fun. So I'm, I'm not regretting any of my decisions, but from a straight business perspective, well, it probably wasn't the right decision. A lot of people are probably seeing it the same way. So you've, you know, that's part of the hype curve again. I was early on the hype curve. And if you develop things out and you make it easy enough and you still find people with the, you know, identified need, then you can come in and you can save the day, so to say. I definitely take this to heart uh, as someone who has tried to, you know, to have to deal with, uh, Coming up, coming up with a good use case for why we should adopt this whole thing. Where I'm at now, I actually I'm a huge fan of Scala, and uh, don't don't feel the need to do that at my current current company. Uh, I think everything's everything's good there. Um, but you know, I I I am one of those programmers who I like to code for work, but I also do coding outside of work and love to tinker with other languages and, and things. I have used Haskell in a on a very short professional project um, and I loved every minute of it. Uh, Closure was another one for me that I kind of enjoyed, but then you didn't have all the type systems there. But yeah, this, this rust thing has, uh, I think I've gotten the rust bug a little bit and I'm, I'm, I'm curious to keep trying more of this out. Uh, Now rust obviously had a sort of, you know, systems background to it. um, But it sounds like it's moving into more mainstream things as well. Um, you know, we, we already briefly talked about the different various different library options out there for, for certain things. But uh, do you think if, if you were to start a obviously you're using it at, at FP complete and that makes sense. You, you'd have your own ecosystem already within your company that you've got established around these things. But um, 
would you recommend for someone uh, who's who's starting a new project? Would Rust be? Let's say you were doing a new open source project. Would Rust be a language that you would recommend to to try to start that in, or does it just largely depend on what the use case is for that project? So it definitely depends on the use case. If I was Greenfield, uh, all my projects, all the things I maintain are gone, and someone said, "Okay." you get to spend five hours a day working on some new open source project, choose a language. No question I would choose Rust, but that's me because I enjoy, you know, I'm, I don't enjoy writing Haskell anymore. That's now, you know, it's a language I know. It's the, I'm not, I'm not getting any kind of learning benefit out of it. So from that perspective, yeah, Rust is great. And I'd actually encourage a lot of Haskellers to learn a language like Rust. It forces you to think in a way we haven't thought of in a long time, thinking about memory allocation all the time. It yeah. changes your brain. It's and I think in a good way. Uh, focus on performance. Those are all great. Uh, overall, would I recommend Rust? Uh, yeah, I would definitely. I think Rust is one of the best languages out there today. Uh, where the line, where I draw the line between if I'm going to choose Haskell and if I'm going to choose Rust, some of it comes down to what I'm personally familiar with. Some of it comes down to, and I alluded to this earlier. I'm still not 100 percent convinced. And even with all the ergonomics and all the focus on making things easy in Rust, if you can ever overcome some of that inherent friction from having something like the borrow checker and ownership. I'm going to say straight up, I love the borrow. It's an amazing concept. The idea that they were able to essentially eliminate memory errors without adding in a garbage collector uh, and the extra benefits you get out of it. You don't have to deal with all this crazy bracket stuff that we have in Haskell. You just allocate things and then they go away because they got dropped. It's it's very, you know, it's mind altering from a Haskeller's perspective. It's great. All the things you amazingly don't have to think about. So that's really cool. Uh, on the other hand, having to keep track of, well, do I need to make a clone here? How do I avoid making a clone? You know, there, every time I write Rust code, I end up adding in a clone and then sitting there and hating myself. I should have figured out a way to not have the clone. In fact, I have a blog post that I'm it's on the other screen right now, <laughs> talking about that exact thing happening yet again on a program that doesn't matter. But I was just so interested. What are the ways I could get away from it? Uh, so anyway, it, should you use Rust for a project? There are definitely strong reasons. At the end of the day, will you be as productive with Rust as a language like Haskell or Python? I don't know. I don't know if that's really going to be uh, the case. I know a lot of Rustations make that claim. I'm not sure... I'm not deep enough into it yet to say that I believe them completely. Uh, but maybe, maybe that's going to be the case. Uh, hopefully I'll get more opportunities to write code instead of just, you know, being a manager at a company. <laughs> and I'll be able yeah. to say, say a little bit more about that. We had talked about DevOps earlier in this. Uh, when it comes to DevOps, I mean, we, you know, we talk about programming and uh, business logic or, you know, whatever it is you're doing is great. But uh, when it comes to getting your code out there, how does that work out in the in the Rust world? Is that do you find that easier, harder? Uh, any recommendations you have uh, on that side of things? I find it one hundred percent exactly identical to Haskell and any other language because I've standardized on Docker. Okay. And for all the crap that Docker gets, and I could give you lots of crap about Docker. Uh, we've been doing containers at FP Complete since before Docker. We were using LXC. That's the thing that under that was sitting underneath uh, FP Haskell Center. So we've been in this container business for a long time. And on the one hand, it's ridiculous. You're going to ship an entire operating system to run in your hello world little statically compiled Rust application. Just take that as an example. That's insane. That makes no sense at all. On the other hand, well, it worked. So it worked. I'm happy. Just do it. Move on. And this is, you know, this is a typical trade-off that we get to have in the technology space. You know, you have people, again, I've talked about one spectrum before, and we talked about like this purist versus pragmatist. On the one purist side, you know, you have the Nix people, but they're not purists enough. Let's go for the extreme, unikernel people. Everything should be a unikernel. You should have everything compiled down to a single executable that's going to run straight on the hypervisor. There are a lot of reasons why that makes a lot of sense. I've never actually done it myself, but there are a lot of reasons why that makes a lot of sense. The amount of code you are throwing away pre-existing work that you're throwing away by doing it that way is insane. Do you get a better product at the end? I think so. I think when you do it, it comes out better. On the other hand, with Docker, well, I'm just going to grab Ubuntu because I know how to apt get install something in Ubuntu. Okay. And now I have a 2.3 gigabyte image 
that's got my Haskell thing and it's 2.3 gigabytes because I had to pull in the CA certificate so that I'm able to make an HTTPS connection. Uh, and it acts, oops, by mistake, I pulled in 15,000 other libraries at the same time and it deploys to the server. And well, it takes, you know, it takes 20 seconds to pull the image from the local Docker uh, registry, but then it works. Well, it worked. Maybe I can go work on some features instead of tinkering with optimizing my build process or optimizing all these other things. And that's, that's in, in my mind, that's like one of the quintessential operations level trade-offs you got to make. Yeah. Do, do you deploy out on uh, Kubernetes? I'm also curious if you're using uh, Terraform or something else. So we are on AWS Azure and on-prem. Uh, our own stuff is all sitting on AWS. But for customer work, we've done all of those. We've done a little bit with the Google, but not much. Uh, when it comes to AWS, we, we almost exclusively use Terraform for managing our infrastructure. On Azure, we use a little bit of Terraform, but we've also just been using the AZ command line tool. Uh, we believe in this, you know, the immutable infrastructure, declarative infrastructure stuff. That works great with Terraform. But one of the things is if you're using Kubernetes, once you get the Kubernetes cluster up and running, you don't really need Terraform as much anymore. The manifest files themselves are the declarative inf infrastructure. So you kind of, you get into that kind of a world. You start to treat Kubernetes as the thing you're deploying to instead of the cloud. And we're definitely in that realm. And I would, you know, I can definitely point out there are plenty of limitations with Kubernetes. Kubernetes is not something that I look at as the holy grail and the greatest thing that's ever existed, but it has massive in industry adoption. Uh, it's making improvements all the time and it works pretty well. It works well enough for most use cases. It's a complicated beast. It's written in Go and it breaks all the time. Uh, it encourages some bad practices. All those things are true. And I know people hate, I'm not a fan of YAML either. I, I use YAML everywhere. Again, it's got the industry adoption. So there are plenty of reasons to hate what's going on there. On the other hand, it works pretty well. Yeah, we use Kubernetes for all of those kinds of setups. Yeah, I was, I was going to, you already mentioned it, but I was going to say it is written in Go. So there's that. <laughs> I'm sure someone out there will, uh, maybe at some point, there was this thing about Linux. Someone was trying to rewrite it in C++, the Linux kernel. And I was like, why? I'm sure someone will try to rewrite Kubernetes in Rust. Who knows? So, so Linus has actually said that he won't let that happen. And if it means that C++ developers won't work on the kernel, he considers that a feature, not a bug. <laughs> okay. That's an interesting way to put it. Um, I guess that's right. cool. Linus, who is still a little bit more controversial in the way he approached yeah. things. He, see, he seems to have changed a little over the last uh, few years. Um, yeah. So for sure. Are there any, any other uh, comments or topics or things you wanted to discuss? I don't know. This has been a lot of fun. No, I don't. Yeah. Uh, we, t we touched on the, you know, the things that make up most of my, uh, my tech life. Uh, Askel, DevOps, and Rust really pulls it together. And we got to make fun of Go and Perl. So. We did. We oh, did. PHP. We made fun of PHP, which is yeah. you know, vital. Important. Yeah. If, if you're interested in the future, uh, I'd be more than happy to have you back on the show again in the future. I, I would love to. Uh, this is uh, no, truly enjoyable. I'd yeah. If we were in person, I'd uh, say we should go out to, you know, for some beers. Absolutely. Point. Absolutely. Or, maybe, or maybe, maybe one of these days I will have to uh, take a trip. You're, you're in Israel. I'm in Israel. I'm in yes. Israel. I've never been, but I've always been interested in, in that. Uh, I need to do more traveling for sure and, and see more places. Israel, so Tel Aviv is where everyone wants to go. I'm not in Tel Aviv. Okay. Uh, and I don't know Tel Aviv. I've been, it's ridiculous. I think I have European friends who have been to Tel Aviv more often than I have. It's insane. Wow. Okay. But yeah, there's uh, there's a lot to see here. You've got the tech world, you've got the modern world, you've got the archaeology, you've got some nature, you've got the religious side, everything, every, yeah. everything, uh, a lot of stuff in a very small piece of uh, land. <laughs> yes. <laughs> No, that definitely interests me. If I am ever out in uh, in Israel, I will definitely hit you up. We'll have awesome. to get some lunch or something. Uh, awesome. Let me know if you're ever in the U.S. Um, I will. You, I, I you probably don't want to come here right now. <laughs> it looks a little crazy over there. We're all kind of scratching our heads. Like, is is the news real? Is this, is, this, <laughs> is is the whole place burning down right now? 
It sometimes feels like it. I will say that. <laughs> so I've been on the other, you know, like I've been on the other side of it of people calling me up, Israel. Uh, you guys are getting bombed. It's, it's normal life over here right now. Nothing's going on. So that's. Like, I was going to ask you. I mean, this doesn't have to go in the the main uh, tech show, but I was going to ask you, like, since I've never been there, like, yeah, I mean, I see the stories we get about what's going on in Israel, but uh, is it really that crazy? Like, is it is it? Um, I mean, some of the stories I hear would make me believe that, like, it's really war torn. Things are no. OK, there, there were times. I mean, in, so the first time I ever came to Israel was in the year 2000. Yeah. I so I can't talk about anything in, from personal experience before that. I went to school here in Jerusalem, in the old city of Jerusalem. I went to school for a year and a half, 2002 to 2004. So it was a little bit of an overlap with the Intifada times. Uh, but I was insulated from it. I was inside the old city. You didn't see very much. You have war torn ideas like you go to the mall and there's someone with a gun guarding it. Uh, but then again, I've gone to India and it's the same thing in India. So yeah. those kinds of things exist and you just get used to it. You know, there are sirens and, you know, if there's a rocket launch, and I've, I've actually been underneath a rocket attack. Uh, I was in the oh, hospital wow. for, for nothing important, but I was in yeah. the hospital. Uh, and so like you're in this ward and there are all these people not talking to each other because why would you talk to other people in the hospital? <laughs> so everyone's in the city, they're doing nothing. Boom, massive explosion. And Lebanon had fired a rocket. It had come over the hospital and Iron Dome, the defense system, and knocked it out of the sky, blown it right over the hospital. Wow. And, that, and then all of a sudden, everyone was best friends. Everyone's telling their war stories. And it does like Jew, Arab, Muslim, it doesn't matter. Like at that yeah. point, everyone's just telling about talking about the great times they've uh, they've experienced with Israeli wars. You know, this was a few years ago. And you know, there are 60-year-old, 70-year-olds, they'd lived through some of the major wars here. And they had they had some stories. I find those stories to be very interesting. Uh I've yeah, I've got a few uh friends, uh, you know, some older friends who have lived lived through some pretty crazy things and love hearing those stories they're they're interesting i mean obviously scary i mean it's it is right. i would not want to be in a situation where <laughs> i've got rockets going on over my head um i mean i did work years ago for uh, the u.s military uh, on a contract um with the air force and so i got to sort of be around some of that stuff for me i got used to being around guns it was just not a uh it wasn't really a thing I, I was afraid of to this day. I'm not afraid of, of that stuff, but it would definitely be scary to have to, this is not a test we're doing on an airbase. This is for real. Right. You, you know, things could, could seriously happen. Um, so that's crazy, but wouldn't stop me from coming out to visit though. The statistician in me, because yeah. that's one of my things. Statistician in me looks at it and says, yeah, like that's scary, but like the, it's still less dangerous than driving a car. And it's one of the things with our kids right now, everything's about COVID and COVID. I, I'd rather they learn how to walk through a street safely. Yeah. That's more important. They're still way, way more likely to get injured and even run over by a car because Israeli, Israeli drivers are terrible. That is, are they, that's are a, they really? Okay. Oh, they are, they are, so, there's, there's a certain, um, there's a rush to everything. And maybe it comes from the fact that it's a war-torn country and everyone has the war mentality all the time. But, uh, and bad drivers. <laughs> it's, it's a different kind of bad driver. I'm from LA, which is also the land of bad drivers, right? Yeah. But, you know, LA drivers, it's they're distracted and they don't know how to drive. Israeli drivers know how to drive. They are focused and they're going to kill you. It's very <laughs> different. I always felt like Chicago drivers were more of a pain than LA myself. I don't know. It feels like Anytime I drive to Chicago, I'm very scared. I, I have a, a Mustang, a Ford Mustang, uh, 2018. It is very nice. And I'm always afraid to take it into the city. Like somebody is going to mess up my car. Thanks again. I really appreciate this. We'll definitely have to keep in touch. Sounds great. No, this was a lot of fun. Uh, I learned stuff from you as well. This was very... Wow. No, I enjoy the, okay. it's always really getting different, uh, different insights onto things that I'm working on, things that I'm involved in all the time. Hearing a different viewpoint is wonderful. Well, thank you. I, I, I appreciate that. And I feel honored that you're saying that. Um, all right. Uh, well, thanks again uh, to uh, our listeners. And uh, thanks again, thanks, Michael. Yeah. Appreciate sure. it. Talk to you later.